Everyone has a price. At least, that's the way that the old saying goes. But have you ever stopped to think what yours is? What dollar figure would make you abandon your principles and forsake your reputation? Thankfully, maybe, it's not a choice many of us will ever have to face so overtly. For most communications professionals, integrity happens in the way that you live your life day in and day out. It's not a big, dramatic, briefcase full of cash on the table kind of moment. It's a series of small choices that you accumulate over decades. But for Henry DeVries, then the VP of Public Relations at Forrester's Financial, it was one split-second decision. Stick to his principles, or accept a promotion and a $100,000 a year raise. He says, okay, so this is what's happened, and what you're going to need to do is lie to the board, and we need to cover this up. And I said, yeah, that's not how it's going to happen. The year was 1996, and Henry DeVries was about to get a crash course in navigating a scandal involving marital infidelity, prostitution, and executive embezzlement. And those principles of his would become his only life raft on the sinking ship of a century-old financial and insurance institution. I'm Dusty Weiss. From PodCamp Media, this is Lead Balloon, a podcast about PR, marketing, and branding nightmares and the well-meaning communications professionals who lived them. Thanks for tuning in. Did you know that we put up pictures and episode transcripts for each edition we do? I'll drop a link in the episode notes to podcampmedia.com slash leadballoon, but if you've never checked it out, you should. Plus, while you're there, sign up for the Podcamp Media email newsletter, and you might just get an invite to a special event that we've got coming up later this summer. But for now, well, that's hush-hush. Our guest today is San Diego-based business coach and author Henry DeVries. He's a columnist for Forbes and the CEO of Indie Books International, a boutique book publisher for business professionals. He also has a deep background in the world of PR and marketing, having worked as a sports marketing consultant, an agency president, assistant dean for external affairs at UC San Diego, and in the 90s, vice president of public relations for Forrester's Financial, based out of Toronto. And that is where our sordid little tale begins in this instance. So Henry DeVries, thanks for joining us on Lead Balloon. It's so great to be here to talk about one of the worst episodes in my life. Thanks so much for the invitation, Dusty. I tell people as they join us on this show that this isn't a place of judgment. This is a place of healing as a group. (laughs) And so welcome to your group therapy session, Mr. DeVries. Thank you. The Forrester's organization is interesting in its own right. As I was doing the research ahead of this episode of the podcast, I learned a little bit about it. It's headquartered in Canada. They manage multiple billions of dollars in assets, and they provide insurance and investment solutions to more than 2 million members worldwide. So a really major presence in the world of business and personal finance. But their history, I learned, stretches all the way back to a so-called friendly society in England. And In order to join, prospects had to engage in initiation by combat. Is that true? Well, that's in the olden days. So we got started in Sherwood Forest. If you lived in uh, ye olde England back, you know, 800 years ago, if you lived in a town, you were townsfolk. If you lived in a village, you were a villager. But if you lived out in the country, which was forest, you were a forester. And the foresters banded together. It predated the invention of insurance because maybe the tree is going to fall on you tomorrow and who's going to take care of the widows and orphans. So we would pass the hat. We would have, you know, a central fund. And that's how the foresters got started. Well, I'll say this, my wife and I, not too long ago, signed up for a new life insurance policy once we started having kids. And I've got to say, I would almost prefer trial by quarterstaff combat than I would the process that you go through today, which is trial by medical tests and poking and prodding and blood sampling and invasive questioning. So bring on the quarterstaff is what I say. Yeah, those actuaries, you know, they they made a switch to that to protect it. It was interesting when I would travel around and I would be invited to speak and usually on topics of marketing. I'm a marketing expert. But people want to know, the foresters, tell us about the foresters. And I said, well, I'm the vice president of public relations for the foresters. It's an ancient society. We started in Sherwood Forest. And 
yes, we think Robin Hood was one of our first members, but we don't like to talk about him because our research revealed he stole from everybody, he kept for himself, but he had a great public relations person. And in that noble tradition, I'm here to speak to you today. You know, when you work in public relations for such a long-standing and well-known institution, holding a public relations role really requires you to learn a lot about the history of the organization in addition to the issues that it's managing in its present. And it sounds like this certainly was no exception, but how did you wind up as vice president of public relations at Forrester's? I was um, executive vice president of a large PR agency in San Diego, and I taught at the university in the night, and one of the students was the director of PR for the Foresters, and she invited me in to pitch the account. So I had to study who they were and what they were about, and I was given a three-month trial. And during that trial, there was a hurricane that hit the uh, North Carolina coast, and it went 200 miles inland to Charlotte, and it was taking trees and throwing them around. And the Forester members, it's a fraternal society. So there's a business component, but it's also like the Elks Club or Knights of Columbus. So these people get together and they sent volunteers with chainsaws to remove trees from people's houses and the cleanup work. And the uh, leader of the organization said, well, here's what's happening. What would you do? I said, I don't know, but you should send me on an airplane and I'll go in there. So I went into a disaster zone, interviewed people in one day, and I said, let me get this straight. We've been called the foresters for 800 years, but this is the first time we've had anything to do with trees. And they said, that's right. Well, I got them national coverage. I helped organize the people there to be not only helping the community, but getting credit for it. So with that, Shortly thereafter, it was 1989, there was an earthquake in San Francisco. Game three of the 1989 World Series, the Oakland Athletics. And he fails to get Dave Parker at second base, so the Oakland A's take... take I'll tell you what, we're having an earthquake. You can see power lines are swaying. Uh, it was a very brief quake, but it was a very strong jolt. Part of the upper deck, a section of the upper deck of the Bay Bridge uh, is probably what you're still looking at right now, has collapsed. There are some cracks in the upper rim of Candlestick. That is the Cypress section of the Nimitz Freeway. And you can see, oh my God, look at that. Um, the freeway has just completely collapsed. And 30,000 foresters were in San Francisco. You know, the, the World Series stopped and all this. Mm -hmm. and, well, the leadership of the organization was halfway around the world. They were at a conference in Thailand. And they went to the head person. They say, we've got 30,000 members here. We don't know what's going on. Communications is down. What should we do, sir? And he said, send that guy we sent to the hurricane. So I was sent to San Francisco and I organized this relief effort. We actually had cash, delivered cash to members who needed to find some place to stay or you know get food. We organized this big charity relief effort for all the children who were displaced in tent cities that the National Guard had sent up. And I cut a deal with Toys R Us to come deliver toys and games to keep them occupied and made a call to somebody in Hollywood. And this new fresh actress, Sarah Jessica Parker, flew up to spend the day with me to hand out the toys to the kids in the camp. And I was doing all this and, and you know, you do well by doing good. So we were getting good publicity, but we were doing this great thing. But this mother came up to me and said, are you in charge? And I thought, oh no, yes, I, I'm in charge. I just want to thank you so much for what you've done. Look at the children. They were so depressed. Now they're all happy. I thought, okay, that's a good day. So after that, the foresters said, okay, we want to hire you as the VP of public relations. We want the agency to keep the account. You can still have the agency, have the account, but I want to give you a budget of millions of dollars and a staff of 10 and really blow this out. So that's how I came on board. It was a dream job. I was raising money for children's hospitals. I doubled awareness for the foresters. 
cut all kinds of deals. So we helped child abuse prevention. I tied in with the uh, NFL. I tied in with NASCAR. Just a lot of great things happening. So everything was going so well. So with credibility and growing momentum, Henry threw himself into the job keeping a busy schedule between offices in San Diego and Toronto and trips that took him all over the world. And he says he enjoyed the work, mostly. But in hindsight, there were some red flags and some things that were just downright odd about Forrester's financial. The leader was the president and the supreme chief ranger. And You don't see that on a lot of business cards. No, there actually was a secret handshake, a secret salute. There were all these other things. And then I found out that there's all these other not-for-profits. So Knights of Columbus, Lutheran Brotherhood, but they were all religious. And some were, you know, sons of Norway or something. They were ethnic or tied to a country. This was the family fraternal. Anyone with a family could join. So it was all about the family. I met a lot of good people who were on the volunteer side of the organization who it was like the Elks Club. My dad was in the Elks Club, so, you know, the, the Elks Club was the grand exalted ruler, but my father would always call him the grand exhausted rooster. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I was used to kind of the weirdness on the fraternal side, but these people had hearts of gold and they, they really wanted to help families and children. Because this is a safe space and my budget for legal fees is uh, sparse, Henry and I decided to keep real names out of this story. But Henry says he actually enjoyed working for the President and Supreme Chief Ranger at first. Well, very nice man. Said funny things like, I have an open door policy. My door is always open, except when it's closed. And then it's closed. And his door was always closed. So, you know, very charming man, beautiful wife, beautiful children. I ran the charity the foundation where we gathered money and then gave it to help children. Well, his wife was the head of the charitable organization. And she was great to work with. So a lot of things going right. And then my boss, who was the senior vice president, we're gonna call the president Fred and her ginger, not their real names. It's all in the newspapers, but you know, so we don't have to unchain the lawyers. We'll just call them Fred and Ginger. Well, Ginger was the senior vice president she was the greatest boss I'd ever had. She was smart. She was beautiful. She was energetic. She was willing to travel half the year. We were in England and Canada and the United States. So a big territory and I only had to travel 120 days a year. That was the drawback is because I had to go to all these places and meet all these people and help them and tell the Robin Hood story that, you know, we don't like to talk about them. So I'm on the road a lot. But Ginger, Ginger was fantastic. I was 39 at the time. She was 41. And we put together this crisis management plan and I had done 24 different scenarios on what could have happened. And she comes into my office one day, shuts the door and says, I have bad news. I'm one of the 24 scenarios. She says, well, I've been having an affair with Fred. A lot of the travel, it just so happened he traveled to those places too. And his wife, the head of the charity, hired a private detective, they have photos, they have everything. So it's coming out. So we have to have a meeting with the president now and you have to take over. So we're talking probably another 100,000 in salary that day, taking this position. So she asked you to step into her role? She said, that's what's gonna happen. You're gonna need to step into my role. I'm gonna need to disappear. So we go meet and he says, okay, so this is what's happened. And what you're gonna to need to do is lie about this for several months. We need to lie to the board and we need to lie to people to cover this up. And I said, yeah, that's not how it's gonna happen. Because I'd made a decision a long time ago in my life that I wouldn't lie for anyone in business. And may I tell you how I came to that decision? 
please, because I think that in the world of popular media, we get a bad rap in public relations. We're portrayed as conniving, as blatant liars. And in my experience, the good public relations representatives, the ethical ones, they have a set of red lines that they simply won't cross for anybody. Well, it had happened many times at the agency where the agency president asked me to lie or lie for a client. And I always said the same thing. Well, no, that's not going to happen. Let's figure out a different solution. So my father was my best friend. And my father was a gambler. He liked to gamble. His vacations were to go to Las Vegas. And he played blackjack. Matter of fact, when I went and got my MBA, statistics was hard until the professor said, well, this field was invented by gamblers. And then all of a sudden it clicked in because my father had taught me no matter what the dealer had and what cards you had, what the mathematical play was. Mm -hmm. In this situation, you fold. In this situation, you hit. Except there was one. It was when you had a 12 and the dealer had a certain card, I forget what it was now, between two and six. He said, mathematically, you have a 50-50 chance of winning if you stand or if you hit. So what I advise you for the rest of your life is just make the decision now. Every time that comes up, you'll hit. Or every time it comes up, you'll stand. Because then when whatever happens, you won't like, oh, second guess yourself. You go, okay, that was the percentages and I'll win 50% of the time. Well, in business, I had made the decision, I'm not gonna lie for anybody. This is you know, against my ethics, so I'm not gonna lie for people. So I said, I'm not gonna lie for you, Fred and Ginger. I can help you out of this though. There is a way out of this. And we have to go to the board immediately. We have to say the board is investigating. You have to beg for forgiveness. America will forgive people. Canada will forgive people. England will forgive people if you're honest and share it all out. Well, they didn't like that, but okay. And then I said, however, if I find out or anyone finds out dollar one went the wrong way on this, I cannot save you. If it reveals that somehow you inappropriately spent company money, this will all fall apart. An affair is one thing, but embezzlement is another story entirely. Entirely. So coming up after the break, another story entirely. The top 12 managers, I believe the nickname is The Dirty Dozen, he procures prostitutes to entertain them. That's in a minute here on Lead Balloon. You know, we're coming up on 50 episodes of Lead Balloon, and it has been a real treat to get to tell these stories. But podcasting could sometimes be a lot like yelling out into the void. If I don't get any feedback, I don't know if what I'm doing is working for you. Sure, we've won some awards, and I can see that our listenership has grown over the years. But I don't know what you find valuable about this show. I don't know if I should be doing longer or shorter episodes, more or fewer fun topics, serious topics. And so as we're winding down the fourth season of Lead Balloon, I'm looking ahead to next year, and it would be really valuable to me if you could take a quick survey to help me make this show better for you. Two minutes of your time is all I'm asking. Visit podcampmedia.com slash survey, and I'll drop a link to that in the episode description as well. That's podcampmedia.com slash survey. And speed of milestones, hey, here at Podcamp Media, we recently published our 250th branded podcast episode on behalf of clients. If you want to learn more about launching a podcast for your brand, visit podcampmedia.com. Let's get a meeting on the calendar. This is Lead Balloon, and I'm Dusty Weiss. Henry DeVries had just refused a $100,000 a year raise because it was contingent upon him becoming complicit in a cover-up of an affair between his boss, Ginger, and her boss, Fred. Again, not their real names. But as the public relations vice president at Forrester's Financial, he still needed to help these executives, people whom he considered to be his friends, plot a course through this impending disaster. So he gave them an ultimatum. He could help them, provided there was no lying and no financial malfeasance. And then they set about strategizing the next steps. I think I was fired three times that weekend. 
And I said, okay, so I'm fired. So let me advise you on what we're doing next. And I had to say, Ginger, I think the world of you, and there's no such thing as consensual sex between a president and a vice president. However, you've exposed the company to millions of dollars in potential damage here. And we have to look at that. We have to look at all sorts of things. But they told you that there was no embezzlement. Yes. So I know, Dusty, I know that the media is going to get a hold of this sometime. Matter of time. So I bring in my former director of PR from the agency and say, okay, now I have to reveal everything here. You're my crisis management person. So we did mock interviews over and over. What if they ask you this? What if they ask you that? How do you explain this? I said, my strategy is anything that's a public document anything that a reporter could dig and find, I want all those documents. And when the reporter comes, I will come and hand them all the documents. You don't have to dig for all these documents. Here they are. And my concern is for the members of the organization. So our board is looking into this and that's what's happening. Sure enough, I get a call from the business editor of the San Diego Union Tribune, our daily newspaper, circulation about 400,000 and I come in for the interview. Well, first he's surprised that I'm so helpful coming in for the interview. Then he's really surprised when I hand over all the documents he would have to go find. This included our IRS filings, salaries, all sorts of things because we are a 501c. So we're a not-for-profit by government regulations. These are public documents. Truth comes out. That's lesson one. Crisis PR, if you're gonna have to go to the media, get in front of it. I was not allowed to, but it would have even been better if I had announced to the media the investigation. It didn't wait for them to find out. I said, here it is, an investigation is going on. Kind of the public relations approach of treating it like a coal mine fire. The only way to put it out is to dynamite it. Hit them with all the information you've got or it out there knowing that it's going to come out eventually and nobody can blame you for covering up. So we get to the middle of the interview. And he says, I want to talk about Jimmy. Tell me about Jimmy. I said, well, Jimmy was a former manager of the organization. He was caught with embezzling. He was convicted and did a year in federal prison. When he came out, was Jimmy offered employment? I said, yes, not as a manager, not handling any money anymore, but for his years of service and to help with his rehabilitation, he was given a job. He said, what is his job? And I said, party planner. And the editor said, I'll say. Oh no. So what do you know about the parties he planned for the top 12 managers, I believe the nickname is the Dirty Dozen, who go to places like Thailand, Rio, Amsterdam, and he procures prostitutes to entertain them. This is news to me at that moment. And again, trained by a gambler, poker face, I said, yes, the board is investigating that. And what about, and he kept adding thing after thing after thing. And I said, we're investigating that. We're investigating that. We're investigating that. He said, okay. Oh, he says, wait a minute. Let me see the org chart again. You report to Fred and Ginger. I said, in this matter, I report directly to the chairman of the board. And I walked out of the newspaper office and I called the chairman of the board who was in Colorado. And I said, let me tell you what just happened. And I said, I report directly to the chairman of the board. Was I telling the truth? He said, you're telling the truth. You now report directly to me. Henry had found himself in a position you never want to be in as a professional communicator. He had been driven around a blind corner by people that he thought he could trust. Fred and Ginger had promised him that the affair was the only skeleton in the closet, knowing full well there was another shoe that could drop. Because not only had they hired Jimmy the party planner, but these assignations with prostitutes were being expensed to the company travel accounts. So I went 
back to U.S. headquarters, went into Fred's office. I said, may I have a hug? I'd like to give you a hug. He goes, okay. So I give him a hug. I said, okay. Now, you need to hire a lawyer. And I no longer report to you or to Ginger. I report directly to the chairman of the board. This is what was revealed during the newspaper interview today. So this will be appearing in the newspaper very soon. You need to get things in order. Things started happening very quickly after that. The board of directors ordered a full-fledged investigation of everything. The affair, the sex trips, the whole Megillah. And Henry DeVries was drafted to serve as the board's personal liaison for all of it. Then I was dealing at one time with... I counted, it was like 15 people who were attorneys, forensic accountants, crisis PR people. Essentially, I was in charge of U.S. headquarters and working directly with the board. Long days, every day I would have to type up everything that happened. Industrial psychologists were brought in because I said, I've got 100 people who are freaking out here and I'm not trained. And the industrial psychologist said, what you do is you get them to vent. And then you say, that was good. Now that you've vented, let's move on. I said, anything else? Yes, if they mention suicide, you have to kick it up to somebody. Thank goodness that you brought in industrial psychologists for these people, but what were you doing for your own mental well-being at that stage? Because here you are at the center of this storm that you didn't commit, managing and cleaning up after somebody else's dumpster fire. What were you doing to take care of yourself? And what were you feeling? at that point. I was just committed to the next step. I would say every day, what is the next step? What is just the next thing I have to do? And then one of the things I found is I'm probably going to be in a courtroom one day and it's going to be, what happened on April 27th? No, no. So I would have notes to remember. So that was helping me. It's like journaling, you know, (laughs) but you're journaling, preparing for the trial. The board was coming out and, you know, I was being flown to Toronto and meeting with the board. So I was doing all those things. That was helping. The industrial psychologists were really helping. By the way, they said to me after they interviewed everybody and looked at everything and they said, you know, they should just make you president and Supreme Chief Ranger. And I said, well, that's not going to happen. That ain't going to happen. Don't worry about that. You know, thanks. Oh, I mean, it got ugly. Fred's wife, you know, the head of the charity, comes into the office and does that, uh, you know, Louisville slugger to the headlight song kind of thing. She destroys everything that could break in Ginger's office and takes a knife and rips up leather and all that. And just, and everybody there was just kind of like, okay, let's just let this run its course. You know, the angered, scorned woman with the knife, let's just, let her do her thing. So that had happened. But the thing I wanted to share was my family loved Ginger, just loved her. In fact, we got a dog, an Italian greyhound, and they named her Ginger. The highest honor you can give somebody, you name the family (laughs) pet after them. And she was honored by it. But I came home at night and I would see Ginger. I go, you know, hi, Ginger. And I go, Okay, Ginger's got to go. So we had to give the dog away. I said, this is too painful. Oh, so that big story. I have four children. One was nine and also loved volunteering and doing the charity projects with us and loved Ginger and all these things. And then she calls me at work because she has the newspaper story and read the whole newspaper story. And it needed me to explain some things about the prostitutes, the embezzlement, all these things about these people who she shot. She was wonderful. Ginger's husband was my best friend. He taught me how to play golf. We would hang out. You know, he said, geez, you know, Ginger's doing such an important job. But when she gets back from these road trips, she's just exhausted doesn't want to go out, doesn't want to eat, doesn't want to do much of anything. But I understand, you know, we're doing a good cause. Well, then he understood why she was so exhausted when she got back. And it was a mess. 
It was a mess. I mean, it's not just a professional mess. That's a mess in your personal life as well. There's no firewall between the two at that point for you. No, none. So Ginger and Fred, it sounds like, were aware of the Dirty Dozen and their antics, these trips that they took to incentivize the top salespeople to perform, but really just turned into something very unsavory. When did they let you know that they had been aware of that? And how did they tell you? They didn't, but the private detectives did. So the private detectives that we had to hire brought photo evidence to me. I had to look at all the photo evidence. And Ginger didn't go on these trips. Fred led them. And the boss who hired Fred, who he took over from, he had started the tradition. So it started like in the 60s during the Mad Men days, you know, and it was like, uh, boys will be boys. And if you were on that trip and you didn't want to do that, you excused yourself. I interviewed one guy. He would just always excuse himself and go sightseeing and missed it. And then you didn't get invited on future trips. I found out the label for those people and me, the rap on me was Henry's a Boy Scout. This came out later that they had labeled me as a Boy Scout. And it goes like, he's not going to lie. He's got this family he likes, you know, he's, he's religious. Uh, so there was this facade of family, but behind the facade were just kind of sleazy insurance salesmen. So it was disappointing because there were a lot of good people in the organization. And really that was also the downfall. I learned something early in my career that friends come and go but enemies accumulate. So these people, there were people behind the scenes who learned of it and had to pretend that the facade was real. They kept evidence. And this reporter years later said, I gave you much better treatment because of your way of handling this, of being upfront with information and always being ready to help me. So I gave you the benefit of the doubt on some things. He says, but I got to tell you, I've never had a story like this because my office was flooded every day with people sending more information and more photos and everything anonymously. But there was just so much from so many different sources that like, okay, there's some big fire here that we're going to write about. You don't have enough buckets to keep up with the leaks. Right, right. Whether it was airing decades of dirty laundry or crying in the car after work, there's no doubt the employees of Forrester's San Diego office felt every agonizing moment of the investigation into the scandal. And like a captain going down with a ship, Henry kept a steady hand on the till and tried his best to be a visible model of serenity and acceptance. But eventually, the time came to present the final damning report to the board. So the board, I said, you've got four choices, really. It's... Fred and Ginger stay. Fred goes, Ginger stays. Ginger stays, Fred goes. Fred and Ginger go. So they chose Fred and Ginger go. They also decided to shut down U.S. headquarters and a hundred people lose their job. And a lot of people were mad at me for decades because if I wasn't a Boy Scout and I'd played along, those people would still have their jobs. Though I'm more of a let justice be done though the heavens fall. I was offered a position to go to Toronto to emigrate to Canada. I got to read the booklet. The settler is allowed to bring enough goods that can fit into a Conestoga wagon. <laughs> they had not changed the rules since 1850 about emigrating to Canada. And I read all the things about where my rights as an alien resident. And I said, okay, that's bad. I had done all the studies of all these other corporations. Whenever a new president comes in, they clean house. I said, I'll be fired and I'll be in Canada. So I declined. My old agency said, come back to the agency. You have your old position back. The foresters uh, said, keep the account, expand it. We need you to cover a lot of things while we sort things out. So the new president completely cleaned house. Every vice president there, there were 20 of them, were gone except one, the woman who was in charge of investments. She was doing a really great job, so they didn't want to get rid of her. Everybody else had to go or had to change somehow. And we laid off 100 people. The organization keeps going. Fred finds some other job in the financial services. 
Ginger gets a huge settlement, does some entrepreneurial things, gets back together with her husband, my good friend, former good friend. He comes, sees me years later and just kind of does the debrief on things that were happening and that we're good. We can never be what we were, but we're good. You know, Henry, I've worked around my share of powerful people, executives, politicians, media personalities. And when you meet enough of them, you come to realize that some of them are really good at wielding power. They keep themselves focused on serving people or an institution or the greater good. And some people get power and they come to the conclusion that the rules don't apply to them. Why is that, do you think? Well, we all have heard the adage that power corrupts and it blinds people. There's a famous quote where someone said, all I wanted to do was to provide people entertainment. And what did I get for it? The existence of a haunted man. Those were the words of Al Capone. So Al Capone saw that he was in the entertainment business and that he was a victim. So people of power, their minds get warped. They certainly get warped around money and things to do with money. Things like, well, you know, I work hard, I'm doing great. Fred had grown the organization. It was very successful under him from a financial standpoint. I think in his mind, it justified some things. Not only professionally, but personally, I know that that must have had an impact on you as well. This is someone that you worked with and Ginger as well. These were people that you thought that you knew. I went through a similar experience where an elected official that I served when I was public relations representative at City Hall. Years later, it turned out he was peddling influence and soliciting bribes on the side. And when you go through life in a position like I was in, you think you're able to pick, okay, that's one of the good ones. That's one of the crap heads. That's a good one. This is somebody that I thought was one of the good ones. And so when I found out that what he was doing was awful, it hurt me personally. Did you ever confront Ginger or Fred from a personal standpoint? After it all went down, after a couple of years, I talked to Ginger. I didn't blame her or anything like that. I just wanted to listen to her. And she shared some things that she had seen, but I didn't blame her. Fred, I confronted when I gave him the hug, told him to hire attorneys, and I told him I think he has a sex problem and needs to get treated for it. That was the end of our relationship. That lesson that your dad taught you about making up your minds so that you don't have to make it up in the moment. Whenever you live your life by a credo or an edict like that, there are always gonna be situations that test those red lines that we draw for ourselves. Not everybody has their ethics tested when a hundred thousand dollars are on the line take me back and put me in your head in that moment when you had to literally choose between your principles and an extra hundred thousand dollars a year there are three ethical perspectives you can have and one is what helps the greatest number another one is what has to be done in the situation but the third one is there's right and wrong. And I fall in that ethical perspective, that there's right and wrong. And I sleep well at night, and my side of the street is clean, and that integrity is not for sale. It wouldn't be for sale for a million dollars. It wouldn't. My mom was a New York waitress, and she we used to say when I was a kid, if you're gonna steal, be sure it's a million dollars. And they heard about it at the school, and they were appalled. And I have to tell you, Mom worked for a large organization when she was young, a family organization from a certain European country. But what she meant was, don't sell your integrity. If you're going to do that, make sure you get a lot because your life's going to be ruined for it. That's what she meant. As one Boy Scout to another, I have to say, my hat is off to you there because I think that principles are easy to have when they're not tested. But when you see your principles put on the line for a dollar figure like that, I think it becomes really easy for some folks to forget that they have them. So that's the story, the aftermath. I returned to the agency. I was offered a sweetheart deal to take it over. And then I got my MBA, executive MBA. 
And I realized the sweetheart deal was not a sweetheart deal. It was indentured servitude and it would be a horrible deal for me. So I branched out and in February of 1999, I started my own agency, which has morphed seven years ago into Indie Books International. So we're really a marketing services agency in disguise as a publishing company. I help independent consultants who want to attract high paying clients by marketing with a book and a speech. So I help them get a book published. I help them get speaking deals and go on the speaking circuit. I train them on how to be better at business development. And a few years ago, Forbes.com uh, hired me to write about that on a weekly basis. And I've since published 12 different books on marketing. And that's my story, Dusty. Henry DeVries, the CEO of Indie Books International. This has been a fantastic conversation. Certainly a lot for PR and marketing professionals to parse here and learn from. How do we learn more about you and what you're up to at Indie Books International? Thank you so much for asking. People can go to my website, which is Indie, I-N-D-I-E, books, B-O-O-K-S, I-N-T-L dot com. And if you wanted to have a no-cost strategy call with me, you can book it there. If you want to go to our learning center, lots of articles, just a lot of information. Our brand is generosity, so we're generous in giving information away. Well, and certainly generous as well in other ways. You're also a columnist for Forbes, and you recently penned a delightful piece about us here at PodCamp Media, Lead Balloon and our storytelling mission here. So I'm only too happy that I was able to have this fascinating discussion with you. The former vice president of public relations for Forrester's Financial, CEO of Indie Books International, Henry DeVries. Thanks for joining us on Lead Balloon. Dusty, so great to spend some time with you today. That is going to do it for this episode of Lead Balloon. If you enjoy the show, why don't you pull up your podcast app right now and hit that share button. Put it on your social or email it to a colleague or friend who might also get into it because, frankly, I'm too cheap and too busy to do a programmatic ad buy right now and word of mouth is still the best advertising there is. Lead Balloon is produced by PodCamp Media, where we provide branded podcast production solutions for businesses. Check out our website, podcampmedia.com. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Larry Kilgore III handled the dialogue editing on this episode. Until the next time, folks, thanks for listening. I'm Dusty Weiss.